I get travel anxiety. This is one of the most magical experiences. I just knew that I needed to do this trip solo. I bought some cigs at the market by your place. I gave up drinking again. It's been days. I need a voice from something that's not blue. So I'm lying. Good morning, guys. I'm going to brush my teeth right now. I just woke up and made the bed. I fell asleep with my girlfriend Tori on FaceTime, which is like my favorite way to fall asleep. And we had a FaceTime sleepover, so when we woke up, we just kind of like chatted with each other a bit. And I'm kind of like rushing my morning routine because today I'm going to be driving three hours to uh, southern Arizona area to watch a bird migration. Uh, it is some sandhill cranes and just during the season they're migrating and apparently it's a really cool thing to watch. Thank you to Maddie Taylor for recommending this to me and sending me the coordinates. Yeah, I have my binoculars, so it's going to be fun. Okay, I am going to do this self-reflection pack. Let's see. This is by the brand We're Not Really Strangers, so I'm just gonna shuffle it. Who do I feel most myself around? Why? Uh, obviously and definitely my girlfriend, Tori. I mean, that's why I'm dating her, you know? I feel like myself around her. I think the reason why is because we just have this mutual understanding. Like, we already when we met believed in a lot of the same things it wasn't like we had to sacrifice our beliefs to understand each other or we didn't have to try to see each other's viewpoints because we already kind of did and i feel like because of that it's allowed for a really beautiful relationship in the sense that i definitely feel the most understood by her out of anyone she like feels like home and i've just invested a lot of energy into that relationship and she's invested a lot of energy into like working out any problems we have or just communicating if we aren't seeing eye to eye and I feel like because of all that work we've put into it she just really feels like home to me and I feel like I can be my authentic self around her and I don't have to force anything so I would say I feel most myself around her I feel like my best self around her Driving on dirt roads is always a little scary at night, like driving to a campsite. So last night I came into that campsite and I was just following like the pin I had that I had gotten from this app iOverlander, which is where I find campsites. And I had never been to that campsite before, so you know, you don't know what to expect. And then the road forks, the dirt road starts to get a little more narrow and there's more terrain and you just kind of wonder like how hard is this road gonna get like is my van going to be able to do it all of that gives me a little bit of anxiety like coming into a new campsite not knowing what to expect not knowing if it's a good road or not and I think like traveling solo there's all of these little anxieties especially when you like first start a couple years ago when I first started 
I had anxiety getting on the road and then that kind of like dissipated and I started to get the hang of it and I started to build a comfort zone around traveling solo. It wasn't new to me anymore and so it wasn't scary and it didn't give me anxiety. But it's been like a year and this year I haven't really traveled solo a ton. I just feel like all of these, these new feelings, like these exciting but also anxious feelings. I get travel anxiety sometimes, like just not knowing what to expect and having to make all of the decisions yourself. Do I wanna go here? Do I wanna do this? Like, I don't really know. And usually if someone else is visiting me, I just ask them, like, I'll, I'll be like, hey, Taylor, what should we do? And Taylor is so decisive, she's like, let's do this. And I'm like, okay, that's great. When you're traveling solo, you have to make all those decisions yourself. And you have to decide, where do I wanna to sleep tonight? How long do I wanna drive? Do I wanna do this thing or that thing? Like, there's so much to do, it's almost overwhelming. Like, in every single state, you could go to a cool campsite here, you could go bird watching here, you could go on this hike up north, you could go dig for crystals in the south. Like, and you just have to kind of decide and prioritize what you want. I have grown so much from traveling solo. And even though I get travel anxiety sometimes, I feel like it just resembles me getting out of my comfort zone, which ultimately I think is a really good thing because I grow more than I ever would if I stayed within my comfort zone. I just finished up cooking and then I washed the dishes and I got out my binoculars because we are going to watch this bird migration. They are sandhill cranes and it's in uh, southern Arizona. So yeah, I am going to go check them out. Look at my binoculars. They're so cute. And honestly, this is such a great way to break up driving because I, like, my back was really hurting. Driving for long hours for extended periods of time really takes a toll on your body. This is one of the most magical experiences ever. Their noises are so cool. And when you look up into the sky, they fly in like layers. It almost looks like layers of clouds. Then you can hear them calling, like as you can hear now in the background. And when you look up, like there's some that are so far away that you can't even tell they are sandhill cranes until you put your binoculars on. And it's so magical and probably one of the craziest wildlife experiences I've had. Uh, I wanted to read this sign that I took a picture of to you guys. It says, As autumn approaches, sandhill cranes, along with a multitude of other migratory birds, make their annual journey south to their wintering grounds, some of which are found in Arizona. Migrating from locales as far away as Siberia, over 30,000 sandhills winter here. 
Cranes typically travel in flocks of three to several hundred and fly with their necks outstretched and long legs trailing behind. Just after sunrise, long undulating ribbons of cranes are common sights as they leave roosting areas and fly out to feed. They dine largely on agricultural crops, favoring corn above all else. Cranes are quite vocal, calling nearly constantly to each other and to other flocks. Their melodious call, a gurgling trill, carries incredible distances. It is not uncommon for them to be heard long before they are seen. I thought that might be better than my binoculars, but I don't even know how to get that one to work. I think mine is probably the best. Can you hear them? They are so cool. They're like all flying right now. It's very hot in the van. I am just going to make a little matcha. Uh, I'm just kind of wanting like a cold drink while I drive. I have like three more hours and I'm getting to another campsite. So this is my ice cube thing and they come out in circles. It's just really helpful, honestly, because it kind of contains it very well. Goodbye, Sand Hill Cranes. I love you guys. What is this? Okay, I'm supposed to go to this campsite, and it looks like I'm supposed to go through here, but it says no. I'm just so confused, like, yeah, it says I'm supposed to go through here to get there. Okay, so I actually see a road here. It looks like this is a road. So I'm gonna attempt this. I think this is right. Because if you see that, that thing to the left was the gate there, this looks like a dirt road. Okay, we're back on track. I got so sad for a second there because I know there's no other good campsites around where I'm at. I've been driving so long, my back literally hurts. It's happened to me before that I go to a campsite and it says it's available online, but then I get there and there are gates closed and it says the campsite is closed and stuff like that. So I was really sad and I started to get worried that the campsite was closed, but this road looks correct. So I'm so excited to get to this campsite my whole body is hurting right now because i've been driving for so long like my back and i think when i get there i'm going to do a bit of stretching Oh, I feel so good. I'm so happy. Like, I could cry tears of joy. Being alone feels so good. Like, I feel like it took me a day or two to get adjusted. And now that I felt a little more adjusted, it's like a breath of fresh air. I feel like myself again. Like, I feel like I've 
neglected myself so much by spending so much time with other people recently in this recent phase the people i surround myself with are the most amazing beautiful people ever but i don't think you can give your all to these people unless you've really like checked in with yourself and spent time with yourself and it just feels so good to be doing that again because i feel like it's been a really long time since i really checked in with myself and spent an extended period of time totally absorbed in myself not on social media not watching tv but like what are my thoughts right now what are my thought patterns and i think it was all this turning point when i went on that recent recent backpacking trip and i noticed my thought patterns all of a sudden i was like this is really negative i just knew that i needed to do this trip solo even though i felt so tempted to invite people and invite my girlfriend or invite my friend like i knew this would be such an important trip for me and thankfully i have people around me that so support my alone time and I feel so grateful for that because I don't have people that like shame me for wanting alone time or make me feel guilty for it like even one of my friends uh, he like wanted to meet up today and he was like oh you're in the area like you should meet me here and I just told him like honestly this trip my intention was to spend a lot of alone time and like check back in with myself and I really want to see you I'm gonna make that happen and I'm gonna make it a priority to see you but for at least a big portion of this time here I want to be spending alone and he was so respectful and he's like I totally understand like I get like that too I need my alone time also and it just made me feel really grateful like my girlfriend my friend here in Phoenix they're all really understanding of me wanting alone time because I feel like everyone wants it and it's just all how you frame it he, even just coming to this campsite I was like oh my gosh I just got chills I feel so happy and I came in at this perfect time where the lighting was just hitting the mountains and the saguaro cacti in such a beautiful way anyways going off on a tangent on that today on my drive i drove past like this big dairy farm that spanned for a really long time i actually took a video of it but i took a video towards the end of my drive like because it started to baffle me i was like whoa there are so many cows on this plot of land like there are acres and acres filled with cows and then i looked at the width of the land like I was driving through the length of it, but even the width was spanning so long, filled with cows in these sheds. They have like plants and trees lining it on the road so that you can't totally see the extent of what's happening. And I feel like when you're reading about animal agriculture and the injustices of that industry, it's like kind of disassociative because you can't comprehend the scale at which it's being done. You can understand, okay, in the dairy industry, they artificially inseminate the cows. And after that, the cows give birth. And after that, they take away the babies from the mothers within 24 to 48 hours. And then after that, once the mother cow can no longer produce like the quantity of milk that the dairy farmer wants, they are sent to slaughter at a fraction of their lives. And what happens with the kids same thing the male calves get killed for veal or beef the female cows has the same fate as their mom basically so it's just this like really horrific kind of cycle that you learn about and then you hear statistics like there are 72 billion animals that that are killed each year in animal agriculture but you can't comprehend that number like no matter how much you hear it you can't comprehend it you know and then when i drive past plots of land like that and farms like all of a sudden it becomes tangible and real and I'm like whoa that's a lot of animals concentrated in one area being exploited I wanted to show you guys this video I got recommended on TikTok from a dairy farmer but it's getting a little dark so I'm gonna go inside and make dinner first
All right, so I found out that this is gluten-free ramen as I was cooking it. I didn't intend for it to be gluten-free. I'm not gluten-free, but let's try it. I honestly haven't eaten that much today because when I drive, a lot of times I like don't take the time to stop to eat because I don't want to stop. Um, but I'm like so hungry right now. So let's try this. Okay. <laughs> It's like way too hot. I need to wait for it to cool down. While it's cooling down, I might as well respond to this. Let's just jump right into it. I'm really happy to answer this question for you. Activists want you to think we largely avoid the topic of slaughter. It's the dairy industry's dirty little secret. Here's what they don't realize. Every one of these cows will be used for food. Whether or not they're raised by humans. They'll feed a predator in the wild, or they'll die a slow death due to some disease or illness. They'll be eaten by microbes, earthworms, maggots, and flies. Or they'll be eaten by us. Every cow who's ever lived will be used for food. Here's what you need to keep in mind. A cow's life is infinitely better because of humans. When they are raised by a farmer, their life is better. They're more comfortable, they have more access to water, and they have more access to feed. My understanding of what he's trying to say is that the cow is going to be used for food regardless. Either a human is going to kill and eat them or an animal in the wild. I think the fallacy within that is that these cows shouldn't exist. They're domesticated. They're artificially inseminated. So they actually wouldn't be used for food. They wouldn't feed an animal in the wild and die in the wild because they're not wild. They're not natural in today's society. Like in today's society, these farmers breed these animals largely, like majority. There's no flies in here, no disease, no illness, and no predators. Factory farms are actually breeding grounds for zoonotic diseases. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic right now, and that's largely believed to originate in a wet market in Wuhan. I mean, we can look at all these other zoonotic diseases like bird flu and swine flu and mad cow disease and those originated from animal farming. So their life is better, and their death is better. There is no humane or uncruel way to die in the wild. There's not. A predator will tear them apart while they're still alive. They'll succumb to a disease or a very preventable illness slowly over days. We've made that process painless and quick, completely contrary to what vegans tell you. If you watch that video, you're gonna see how it happens. Maybe I'm supposed to warn you that if you have a weak stomach, you shouldn't watch it. And vegans will use that argument. They'll say, well, you can't watch it, it's disgusting. That tells you how wrong it is. I have a weak stomach thinking of a surgeon cutting somebody open. I could never pull an abscess tooth from somebody's mouth. Thank God for surgeons and dentists. So because I can't stomach those procedures, does that mean those procedures are wrong? No. This part is so baseless. Like, it's taking out the context and the intent of these scenarios. Like, yes, it might make your stomach upset if you watch a surgeon cutting into a human being. It also might make you squirm and make your stomach upset if you watch an animal being slaughtered. But the context is totally different. In one scenario, the surgeon is trying to help the person. It's in the person's best interest. In the other scenario, it's not in the animal's best interest. You're killing an animal at a fraction of their lives and you're exploiting them for their entire lives. So it's just two completely different contexts. One is in the person's best interest. One is not in the animal's best interest and we can assume that they don't want to go to a slaughterhouse at a small fraction of their lives and be exploited and have their babies taken from them. What you'll see in that video is the most, without a doubt, humane way for a cow to go. Remember, cows don't fear death. They don't even know what death is. The next part he says that it's the most humane way for a cow to die. It's so interesting because farmers always use this word humane. When you look up the word humane, the definition is benevolence, kindness, compassion. When I think of compassion and benevolence, I think of putting yourself in someone else's shoes. I think of treating someone with respect. I think that there has to be some lack of respect to assume that they don't value their life the same way we do. There's some disconnect. like. We know that we don't want to die. We know that we don't want to have our kids taken from us. But we can't extend that same compassion to others. Surely we can't when we take their babies and when we put them into slaughterhouses when they don't have to be. It's just so weird when farmers use this word humane. Like, what is that? What does that mean? It's just like a label that you could slap on anything. Is there such thing as humane murder then? Is there such a thing as humane abuse of a dog? Temple has designed this whole process in such a way that that cow is 100% calm up until the moment it happens. So it's interesting when he says that they don't fear death because the person he's talking about, Temple Grandin, years ago she actually looked at factory farming and slaughterhouses and she noticed that cows do fear slaughterhouses whether or not they have an awareness that that is their death 
personally I feel like they do because I feel like animals are very smart you can see in the videos that they fear the slaughterhouse whether or not they know that that's their death I don't know but certainly they can hear other animals of their kind screaming they can smell the blood let's say that in some fairy tale scenario we can really create a factory farm where the animal has no idea that they are being killed does that really make it ethical still like personally I believe that killing in and of itself is unethical and it is immoral inherently obviously there are justifications I think necessity is probably the only one like if we need to kill someone in order to survive whether that's a human in a self-defense scenario or if we need to kill a dog or a pig to survive like we're gonna die and starve to death on an island you know like how non-vegans want you to think of these crazy scenarios yes if you're starving in the wilderness maybe you would be justified to do something like that surely so what he's kind of implying is that if the animal is not aware of their death it makes it somehow moral certainly you could kill someone anyone even a dog or another human being and maybe you shoot them from far away and they aren't even aware that they're going to die but does that make that act in and of itself moral now ask yourself would a cow ever die a calm death out in the wild no it would be cruel and miserable the last thing he said is would there ever be such a calm death in the wild maybe not you know what i mean like there are definitely very cruel deaths in nature nature isn't always kind nature can be very harsh i mean just watch a video of a lion killing a gazelle and you can kind of imagine and see how gruesome of a death that may be for the gazelle at the same time it's hard to apply the morals of nature and a lion onto humans because we are separated from nature in some way whether or not we want to be we all have the opportunity to go to a hospital if we break a leg you know if we get an infection if we get sick and that might save our lives and I know a very few people who don't live in a house that they don't drive a car I actually don't really know anybody the reality is that we're very separated from nature and so it's hard to apply the morals of nature onto us like when a lion kills a gazelle in the wilderness they're doing it because they're an obligate carnivore they're doing it out of necessity and at the same time a lion doesn't have moral agency the lions in the wild don't have a judicial system and lawyers and accountability and consequences for their action when a lion in the wild rapes one another or kills their children or kills each other they're not like getting lawyers like nature is cruel but that doesn't justify humans being cruel it doesn't justify humans killing it doesn't justify humans abusing animals or exploiting them or killing them like we live in a society where we can't point to nature and say like hey it's worse out there so let's just abuse this dog or kill this cow because it would be worse if they were out there like we're just living in such a different world so it's really hard to compare that i guess as a way to morally justify it after that cow is hit by the bolt gun their limbs go wild because you've severed the brain from the spine muscle movements are controlled via the spine all those chemical reactions that move limbs are immediately released from the spine causing the limbs to go wild if you didn't see those legs moving that would be a bad sign i've had so many vegans criticize me for not talking about how the process is done because we're ashamed of it i'm not ashamed of it we're not ashamed of it he's saying he's not ashamed of it as a way to say look this isn't wrong because I'm not ashamed of it if I'm ashamed of it it implies that it's something wrong if I'm not then it implies that it's it's good and it's ethical or whatever but I don't think that's necessarily true you could look at people in prison who have done horrific things and sure there are some people that are ashamed of it but there are probably other people that aren't ashamed of it and they're like yeah I did it I didn't feel bad like I it did not hit a chord in my heart that doesn't make the act in and of itself of what they did ethical just because they're not ashamed of it. Vegans also don't like the idea that the date of their death is predetermined. Dates of all of our deaths are predetermined. If I don't choose when she goes, a predator, disease, or an illness will. Yes, in some spiritual context, maybe you could argue that, like, there is a higher power that knows when we are going to die, and I don't kind of deny that. But just because we are all going to die at some point doesn't justify intentionally killing someone. I think that's really it. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, I'm going to finish eating this ramen, and I'm going to FaceTime my girlfriend because we have kind of this tradition where we FaceTime every night. I feel like that's just the organic tradition that has been happening when we're not together. 
thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you guys in the next video in three days and if you did enjoy this video please like and subscribe if you haven't already because it really supports my channel bye